Hello, and welcome to A Health Podacy. We have actually encountered a few instances with tribal citizens who aren't necessarily convinced that climate change is happening. Or if they see the climate changing, the response will be somewhere along the lines of, we've been adapting to change for centuries, and we can adapt to this too. I'm your host, Alan Weil. Today, we're talking about climate change and how indigenous communities are responding to it. In 2016, the United States Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the National Indian Health Board launched the Climate Ready Tribes Initiative. That initiative provides funding and technical assistance to 10 tribes around the United States to work on climate change. One participating tribe is the Paula Band of Mission Indians, who live in north central San Diego County in California. As part of the project, the Paula Environmental Department conducted a vulnerability assessment regarding the effects of climate change. High temperatures, more wildfires, storm, flooding, and drought were all identified as effects. But what are the health consequences of these events? And how should the tribe prepare to handle them? Shasta Gon, director of the Environmental Department for the Paula Band of Mission Indians, was co-author of a paper that we published in Health Affairs in December of 2020. It describes the initiative, and today I'm here with Shasta to discuss this and other questions. Dr. Gan, welcome to the program. Thank you so much, Alan. I'm really excited to be here. Well, we're so happy you're with us. Why don't we start with a little background? Just tell us a little bit about the Pala, their history, how they live today, whatever would give our listeners a sense of what their life is like. Pala has actually quite a complex history. The original reservation at Pala was based around a village of Luiseño people or Poyom Kawichum people. And about 25 years after that reservation was established in, in 1875, uh, in 1903, the reservation was expanded and a group of Cupeño people from east of Pala joined the Luiseño on the Pala reservation. And they had been removed from their ancestral homeland at the village of Koopa in a little town that's now called Warner Springs as a result of just a variety of factors that combined to have the federal government conduct this removal. And it was actually the last removal of its kind in United States history where the federal government forcibly removed a people from their ancestral territory to a reservation. So since that time, you've had both the Luiseño and Cupeño people living together in Pala as as one political entity with these two separate lineages from these different cultures. Uh, Although the cultures are very closely related, the languages are very closely related, but that makes Pala a little bit different than some of the other tribes that are more consistent in terms of their, their cultural makeup. So as we talk, do bring our attention to where that matters. Let's uh, just start with this Climate Ready Tribes initiative. How did you become involved in that? We've been working on climate change adaptation and mitigation strategies in Paula for a long time. And I've been working in Paula for 16 years. I've been the environmental director for 10 years. And, you know, it's easy to notice the impact of climate change on the tribe, on the environment, you know, on the lifeways. And so we started to seek funding through the Paula Environmental Department for some projects and programs that would help us to address the effects of climate change. So through that and through our different research and and the different funding agencies that we were able to access, we became aware of this opportunity through the National Indian Health Board's Climate Ready Tribes Initiative. And so we applied for that funding and we were fortunate that they liked our proposal and were willing to fund some of our work. So we are now about to start our third year of funding under the Climate Ready Tribes. And it's really been a a terrific project and opportunity for us to bring this work, not just to Paula, but to tribes throughout the United States. Yeah, I'm eager to hear more about this. So as I understand it, you started with a vulnerability assessment. What did you find were the key vulnerabilities? So a lot of climate vulnerabilities in tribes are a little bit different than the vulnerabilities that you find in non-tribal communities. So 
along with some of our kind of more typical climate vulnerabilities that people might think of, things like extreme weather events or an increased risk of wildfire, we also found vulnerabilities that were specific to the cultural values and the traditions of the people of Paula. So an example of that is that something that's more classically associated with climate change in California, like extreme heat, has an effect on a cultural value in Paula that revolves around oak trees and the harvest of acorns. So extreme heat and drought associated with that have weakened the oak trees in the area and made them either less likely to produce good crops of acorns or in some cases they don't produce at all because heat has made it so that the you know the buds that would turn into acorns end up getting you know withered away and they don't produce and so given that the acorn was the traditional subsistence food of not just Paula but a lot of tribes throughout California there's a, still a maintenance of that tradition of gathering acorn and making we wish which is the traditional acorn mush and the fact that the oak trees are stressed and they're not producing and in some places they're they're dying has made it so that it's so much harder to be able to gather enough acorn to be able to have a store of them in place so that when there is a special occasion, a wedding or somebody passes away uh, and, and you can't make the we wish because you don't have the acorns, that's a vulnerability. It's a cultural vulnerability. And that vulnerability leads to emotional and mental health implications as well because if your identity as a tribal person is tied into the ability to access these traditional foods and that access gets taken away, what does that mean for your identity as you know, a member of the community? It's very significant and it's not the typical vulnerability that somebody thinks of when they think about climate change. Yeah, I'm thinking, you know, we sort of romanticize this notion of the relationship to the land among indigenous peoples and think of that as a strength, but you're saying it also sets you up for more psychosocial conflict or internal conflict when that ecosystem changes. Absolutely. And it's certainly not limited just to what's happening in Paula. In my work, I now have colleagues all over the country working for tribes or working for tribal serving organizations. And we're hearing more and more about the effects of climate change on things like say the salmon runs up in Northern California and up into the Pacific Northwest or in the upper regions of the Great Lakes where there are tribes that have traditionally subsisted on the wild rice harvest and now the wild rice is not growing in the same way. I had a, a colleague say to me once in a way that was just very powerful, he said, you know, who am I as an Anishinaabe if I can't harvest the wild rice? And that is just, that's really stayed with me. So there's this sort of existential crisis created in addition to all of the practical challenges of having enough food and place to live. Uh, your project focused a lot on resilience. What, what does that mean in this context? Resilience is, at this point, is kind of one of those buzzwords that people use when they're talking about climate change adaptation. And so, you know, resilience in the broadest sense means strength and flexibility. So kind of a cliched analogy to that is, do you want to be you know, the palm tree that can bend and flex in the wind, or are you going to be you know, the oak tree that is just unable to bend and ends up being uprooted by the storm? You know, so, and it's kind of a strange analogy to use the oak tree, since the oak tree is the culturally significant species for, for Paula and in California. But that's really what resilience is. It means the ability to adapt to difficult circumstances and continue to survive. And when it comes to tribal resilience, there's centuries of practice, if you will, at maintaining resilience because, you know, from the first arrival of Europeans on these shores, it's been something that tribes have had to maintain is their ability to survive in the most dire of circumstances. And certainly with climate change, we need to tap into that same resilience to be able to continue to survive. Now, there was also an educational component to your project. What did the community need to understand or learn 
about climate change that would help prepare them for the future? One really important thing is just for people to know what climate change is in the first place. And, you know, you mentioned there's this this kind of stereotype about, you know, being at one with nature and, and that sort of thing when it comes to Native American communities, but that doesn't necessarily translate into an innate knowledge of what's going on in the environment around you. So we have actually encountered a few instances with tribal members, tribal citizens who aren't necessarily convinced that climate change is happening, or if they see the climate changing, the response will be somewhere along the lines of, we've been adapting to change for centuries and we can adapt to this to this too. So we have to spend some time explaining to people why this is not the same as the kinds of natural climate fluctuations that tribes may have adapted to over you know, the last several millennia. This is something that is rapid and is going to require a different approach. And then we drill it down into some of the issues that are very specific to our community. What are the risks in Paula? So we're helping to educate people about different strategies they can take to fortify their own homes against, say, the risk of wildfire or planting native species of plants around your home because they're more resistant to drought. And even things like encouraging some of the cultural practices that are already in place, but including climate change as a part of that. So it's always been a value to watch out for your elders and to have you know special considerations for, for children. But now we're asking people, don't just check on the elders as you know a part of your normal routine, but also think about how they're affected when we do have an extreme heat event or when we have a large storm following a long period of drought, which kind of paradoxically creates more risk for flooding conditions. Think about those impacts and integrate those into your normal practices when it comes to protecting the community. Well, that's a perfect place to take a break. Health Affairs may be the leading health policy journal, but did you know we also send a daily newsletter? Sign up for Health Affairs today to catch our daily roundup of news, analysis, and commentary. Topics range from designing value-based payment systems to the latest on COVID-19. And it's free. Head to www.healthaffairs.org and click Newsletter Sign Up in the menu to join the premier health policy community. And we're back with Dr. Gon talking about climate change and the response of indigenous peoples. In your work, you focused on some terms that I saw in the paper, connectedness, calming, hope, safety, self-efficacy. That's a lot to take in. And I'm trying to understand, you don't want passivity here. You you don't want sort of blind acceptance, oh, this is just what's happening in the world, because you want efficacy. But you also want to have some acceptance of the limited control any person or any peoples have over the climate. So how do these concepts fit together? These are some concepts that we developed as part of our psychosocial resilience framework. And that's important because people can very easily become overwhelmed by the risks of climate change and the potential impacts that they face. So One of our fears is that because of that sense of being overwhelmed, people are in the community are just going to start to feel like there's nothing that they can do. And you end up with stress and anxiety. And, you know, those things are not just mental health effects. They have physiological effects. And, you know, as we've already touched on, when it comes to a tribal community, they have effects on identity and tradition and cultural practice. So we felt that for people to be able to maintain that resilience that's so important, we have to provide ways to strengthen people's emotional and mental health in the face of these these tremendous impacts. And, And that's where all those terms tie in. If we can give people a sense that they have more resilience than they knew or that they can help others in their community strengthen their own approach and their own reaction to these difficult problems, that baseline is what we need to maintain overall community health. You know, we find that the more strength people have to help themselves and help each other 
in kind of informally managing some of these mental health and emotional health impacts, the better that they are able to focus on and handle the physical effects, not just to individual health, but to the environmental health, you know, and the cultural health of the surrounding community. So one of those that I think is really important is uh, the self-efficacy that if you yourself feel strong, then you can translate that strength to others. And then that ties into this community level strength that you know you are in this together, that it's not just one person doing their one little part, but it's the whole community working together to create that strength. So if we build that basis for community strength, starting with individuals and then knitting them together into a collective, that really helps to mitigate some of these health impacts of climate change. Well, speaking of networks, uh, this project has brought you into a network of other tribes working on similar issues. Uh, what have you learned from those interactions outside of the work with the Pala? One thing I've learned that's really important is that every single tribe is unique. So there are 570 plus federally recognized tribes in the United States and you know hundreds more collectives that are not federally recognized but are still you know tribal communities and it can be a mistake to approach those tribes as if they are a monolith as if every solution is going to work in the same way in different communities there are some communities that are very small and so you need to approach them in that way, you know, that, that you're dealing with just small collections of people. You know, in California, we have 106 federally recognized tribes. And in some cases, those tribes have only, you know, a dozen or fewer members. And then you contrast that with the Navajo Nation, the Diné people, and you're dealing with 300,000 plus people in an area the size of, you know, approximately the state of Delaware. The solutions that are going to work in Navajo Nation are not going to be the solutions that work for Paula or that work for Red Lake or that work for Macaw. Uh, you really need to make sure that you understand and acknowledge the differences between those tribes. And of course, it also relates to the different environments that we're working with. You know, going up to Alaska and, and the Alaska Native people, they're on the front lines. These are the places where they're having to relocate villages because of melting ice and sea level rise. And, you know, I've been fortunate to be able to work with folks who are in that position. And it's taught me a lot about the resilience of those tribes and the lessons that we can learn that can translate to a place like Paula, where we're clearly not dealing with melting ice uh, and really not with sea level rise because we're 45 miles from the coast. But we are dealing with things like potential relocation because of flooding zones or because of high wildfire risk. So you have to look for the similarities, um, but also be extremely respectful of and aware of the differences. And I've just I've been so blessed to be able to work with so many different tribes and be able to see all of the different ways that they're adapting to their unique situations. You mentioned earlier that the Pala is actually two different tribes coming together. So do you even see those differences internal to your work or are they culturally similar enough that that hasn't been an issue? The cultural similarities are really more significant than the differences. So, you know, the Luiseño people, there are actually multiple Luiseño bands. So Pala is just one of them. And some of the Cupeño people uh, actually managed to stay on their lands up in the ancestral territory and became part of the Los Coyotes band, which is in the mountains above Warner Springs. So if anything, I would say that the, the identification with, with one lineage or one group or another has more to do with family relationships than anything else. But when you are facing a common threat, there's no difference in the way that people approach those things. And there's no significant difference in what is important with the Luiseño versus the Cupeño and Paula. Now you mentioned solutions working in one place, not in another. All of this is in a tribal context, but are there lessons here for non-Indigenous people as well? Is it, is it the same lessons or are there others that you would bring? 
I would say that the lessons are in some ways applicable to multiple different communities. And one of the important things I would focus on is underserved communities. So, of course, Native Americans for centuries have been, you know, under this legacy of colonial oppression that has not ended. And we may not be in the the colonial era anymore, but those legacies still continue. And the same is true for uh, African American communities. The same is true for, you know, more recent immigrant communities from South and, and Central America and, you know, in Mexico. And so really it's a matter of looking at the disparate impacts on BIPOC communities, you know, black, indigenous, people of color. But there are also small communities just throughout the United States that are facing some of these issues, you know, regardless of the, you know, the ethnicity or the race of the people who live in those communities. So just a, a level of structural inequality that we face in the climate fight you know, it certainly impacts those communities that are socioeconomically disadvantaged in ways that are much greater than kind of your typical upper middle class or upper class community that tends to be, you know, primarily white. So that's where I would see most of the similarities. Uh, you're trained as a cultural anthropologist. How did you become involved with the Paula Band of Mission Indians? Wow, that's... Uh... <laughs> That's a question I ask myself all the time. Honestly, I, you know, like, how did I, how did I get so lucky is really what I ask myself. And, and it's, you know, the short version of the story is that as a graduate student, I had a professor who was working on archaeology in a Cupeno ancestral territory. And he asked me to be involved in his project uh, on doing a study of uh, cultural plant use or ethnobotany. And so through the ethnobotany work, I met some tribal folks from Paula and just developed and maintained relationships and became interested in doing my PhD work in Paula as well. And you know, I wrote my dissertation on the impact of Paula's casino on tribal politics and uh, an identity. And they just, they gave me a job while I was doing my research, you know, starting back in 2005, I worked at the Koopa Cultural Center here in Paula and I've just never left. And your portfolio is broader than climate. So how do you fit the climate issues within some of these other roles you play? To me, from the most base level, if we don't manage the climate crisis, then nothing else really matters. You know, a lot of the other stuff that I deal with, there's problems that are fixable kind of regardless of what happens with climate. So, you know, if I focus on climate now and we get some of these problems, you know, in check and, and find some solutions, you know, those other things will still be be waiting for me. But it really is impossible, I think, to separate it because, you know, as the environmental director, I'm overseeing air quality. I'm overseeing water quality. I'm overseeing solid waste management. And I'm also the tribal historic preservation officer. So I'm responsible for engaging in consultation with government agencies and developers that are doing building projects, for example. And so we make sure that there's not going to be damage or you know, bad effects on tribal cultural resources, anywhere from archaeological sites to sacred sites. But that also includes a climate component because a tribal cultural resource is not just a physical site, it's these things we talked about earlier, the intangible aspects of tribal culture, like the sacredness of the oak trees or the eagles, which are a really important species from a cultural standpoint. You know, so if those things are threatened, then it, it all comes back to the climate aspect that if we're working on the climate problem, then we are necessarily also overseeing air and water and solid waste and cultural resources. So there's really no separating those things out. Well, I've learned so much from this conversation, and it sounds like you have a fascinating job and a critical role. And uh, I appreciate you taking this time with me. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Health Policy is produced by Health Affairs, the leading journal for health policy research. The team behind the show includes Patty Sweet, Jeff Byers, Brian Dobbs, Julia Vivolo, 
Sarah Kolk, and Sue Ducat. Like the show? Subscribe to A Health Podacy on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Thanks for listening, and have a great morning, day, or evening.